All right, so just to update everybody, um, Kyle hasn't responded to me yet. Hopefully, he'll join us uh, shortly. Um, Isaiah might be caught up with some work stuff, so he might not join us at all. Um, Barrington, I'm glad you were able to, to get here on time. Um, so I'll get started. If Kyle uh, joins us soon, then he joins us. That'd be great. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, this is what I call a good faith space. Uh, weekly show that I do every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Different topics, different panel. Uh, and today is actually a topic that I've been wanting to do for a while. And I got some people uh, today that I actually just wanted to pick their brain and, and see if we have similarities as to why we stopped associating with the Democrats. Um, before I get started, I just want to make clear this is not uh, bash Democrats, you know, rah, rah, Republican or anything like that. The point of this conversation is to point out the flaws that we saw that drove us out of the party um, and, and to have, an, you know, a realistic discussion about the state of politics. Um, and I'll go into my personal story as to why I listen to Democrats as well. So I just wanted to put that out there. This isn't, this isn't a, a, a one-sided uh, Democrats are bad wholeheartedly. This is explaining our perspective as to why we decided to, to make a change politically. Um, so before we get into all that, I want to introduce the panel. Um, we'll start with Keisha. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Keisha King. I I am the founder of the Mass Exodus Movement, which aims to get children into better learning environments. Um, I am also newly the executive director uh, with Moms for America. And um, let's see, and I'm the host of the Keisha King Show. <laughs> uh, so I am glad to be with you all, and I look forward to a great discussion. Thanks. All right, thank you, Keisha. We'll go to Kevin. You want to introduce yourself? Kevin, you there? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah my, uh, my name is Kevin. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, man, I, I don't have uh, those great accolades, man. I'm just a, a, a down home dude here in Houston, you know, um, living life and, you know, loving God and loving my country. And um, I'm, I'm really, really glad that, really glad to be, be on the panel. And, and I'm also really glad, man, that you kind of, said that it's not going to be a rah-rah session, you know what I mean? It's just going to be just a, a talk, you know, talking about, you know, our thoughts and views on things. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to um, hearing hearing some of the, the other people's pers perspective on things. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for, again for being here. Um, Barrington, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Can everybody hear me well? Yes. All right, my name is Barrington Martin II, former congressional candidate for the 5th District of Georgia, founder of United Alliance PAC. I really don't speak about that much, but I'm getting things started on that, and that's just a PAC I started to unite everyone under one nation, one flag, because we're all Americans. And I'm the host of the Barrington Report every Thursday at 7 and every Saturday at 1 on um, iHeartRadio, uh, specifically on the ATL Talks radio station. Glad to be here, Adam. I know you do amazing things, brother. Thank you for inviting me um, tonight. I, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Likewise, man. Thank you for coming on. Um, and I'll introduce myself for people who aren't familiar with me. Um, my name is Adam Coleman. I am uh, the author of a book called Black Victim to Black Victor, which gives uh, social commentary about race, um, family, you name it, um, while telling my personal story. Um, I'm also the founder of Wrong Street Publishing. Uh, it's more of an outlet for free speech, uh, for people to, to write articles uh, with, you know, maybe saying things that are counter to narrative in an intellectual manner. So if you haven't checked it out, go to wrongspeak.net. Um, and obviously hosting this, um, I've been doing it every week for a number of months now, and it's been a great discussion. Um, I actually just noticed Kyle's here just in time. And I'll have Kyle introduce himself in a moment. Let 
Let's see if he gets the invite. Kyle, I sent you an invite to speak. Hopefully you're on your cell phone. Well, Kyle's getting situated. Oh, there we go. Actually, he's speaking now. Kyle, can you hear me? Kyle, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Hey, Adam, how are you? Doing great, man. Um, you're actually just in time. Um, I was just having everybody... No, it's all good. It's all good. Life happens. Um, you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Well, just to give it, I'm not going to ramble on too long. My name is Kyle Maxwell. I just joined, uh, really started youth on Twitter about three years ago. I'm the founder of The Daily Break. It's a new media company I just started last year. We focus on giving object objective news because <clears throat> the media and this current state is in right now is just abysmal. And it's either left or right or whatever. And we focus on putting out objective articles and trying to give people honest news. So that's one sector. Uh, founder of Viva Media Group, that's a marketing company in Maryland. And aside from that, my hobbies are, I mean, I'm a thinker. I like tweeting things and encourage people to think. I'm also working on a book right now about how people become ideologically possessed and succumb to terrible ideas and how we can all become better people and how we can see and give people provide people a clear roadmap for when they're going down a dark path and I'm super interested in uh, this conversation I hope we're talking about good things I hope we're not going to uh, make any strong men out of anyone's views I think it's really important now that we take these ideas seriously and not label people not saying anyone in here is doing that but not you know, call people names or label people or just just create strong men out of what's going on because it's important. And these and these people, not to make it an us versus them for sure sort of thing, but ideas, terrible ideas, and terrible as they are, they're worth talking out and debating because that's what Westerners do and that's what we value. We value truth and we value debate and the dialogue and the love guns. That's, that's what we value. So that's it. Absolutely, Kyle. Um, so I, I'll, we'll get this conversation going. So, so basically, I want to actually go to each, each uh, person on the panel and basically ask, you know, what was the, if there was like a singular moment um, or like a, a pivotal moment that sticks out in your head as to where it really shifted uh, your support away from the Democrats or your support away from the Democrats or basically like pushed you over that line and you said you couldn't, you couldn't do it anymore. Um, so we'll go with uh, Keisha. Keisha, you want to start? Sure. Um, I just realized I'm like the first lady. I'm like the only lady um, on the panel. So <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I have woman privilege tonight. So um <laughs> I first started to question um, my political party uh, right after the 2016 election when um, I was having a conversation with a close family relative. Uh, we were talking about Black Lives Matter, and she said that she was like, you know, I, I like Black Lives Matter, but I don't know why they don't show up when there's Black on Black crime. And I was like, well, you know, that's just because there's all these police that are killing unarmed black men and it's a real problem. And I don't know what it was. I, well, actually, I feel like it was the prompting of the Holy Spirit to lead me to go and look up the numbers. So I said, I'm going to go look up the uh, statistics. And so when I went to go look, I was really confused because I don't know if you guys remember, but back in 2016, 2015, it was the Ferguson riots. It was, you know, hands up, don't shoot and all this. You know, there was a lot of riots and stuff going on, not as bad as 2020, but, you know, certainly all over the news. And so when I saw the statistics and then when I looked at the crime in black neighborhoods, I was very confused. I didn't understand 
clearly, you know, there was more of a problem in the neighborhoods. Um, not to say that, you know, any person that is shot unjustly, that must be, you know, responded to, that must, they, you know, police officers have to be held accountable and things like that. But, you know, it was, it was a much bigger problem in our neighborhoods. And so it kind of prompted me to look up other statistics. And while I was digging around, I found Dr. Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, Milton Friedman, and that it just blew my mind. I had never, first of all, I had never heard of these men and I consider myself a, you know, somewhat educated woman and had never heard of these people um, or their thoughts, ideas, had never really actually listened to the Republican party or conservative idea ideas and um just looking at the you know my two major political party choices i you know naturally um aligned with the republican party conservative values just how i was raised my views on life and just all of those things so it's kind of like i was already a conservative i just really didn't know and so the major breaking point though for me came a, a couple of weeks later I was sitting on my couch and um, God spoke to my heart and told me that my skin color had become an idol in my life. And that was really the major shift for me because God showed me that this, this, this I, idolizing skin, seeing everything through be, being black and not seeing um, my life through Christ was an offense to God. And I had to repent. I had to, uh, you know, God was showing me that I was double-minded. You know, he was like, <laughs> basically, certainly I'm bigger than racism. You know, certain, you, on Sundays, you're saying I'm, I'm the God of all, I can move mountains, I can do all these things. But Saturday through Monday, you're oppressed and you're not, you know, you can't get ahead because you're black. And um, it was just such an eye-opening experience for me. It literally changed my life. I felt like 10,000 pounds had been lifted off of me. And um, it was just, it was very freeing, honestly. It was very freeing to know that I did not have to live under that mentality. And, um, it, you know, I, I've never, I, my life has never been the same, you know, certainly spiritually, because I had rightfully placed God where he should be. And that, that is the very first thing that I should, he is the very first thing that I should look to when I'm looking to define everything, not through being black. That is not, um, that is not the thing that should define you. Um, you know, we give so much credit to skin color, but skin color, it doesn't think, it doesn't reason, it doesn't rationalize. It is literally levels of melanin. That's it. It's going in the dirt, just like, you know, <laughs> toenails, you know what I mean? It is not, we give so much weight to something that is just insignificant. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it changed my life. And I just started getting involved. Um, locally and really uh, getting involved with my local party, uh, Republican Party. And not to say, you know, there's a lot of problems with the Republican Party, too. You know, nothing's perfect. But certainly um, where the Democrats are today, this, as a Christian woman, they don't have anything that I can align myself with. So, um, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you, Keisha. I appreciate that. Um We'll go to Kevin. Kevin, you want to tell us your story? Wow, Keisha, took, she took a, a lot of the a lot of my thunder that I, I was going to was going to use. So I'm going to just piggyback on some of the things that she was saying. So, um, I'm the son of a, uh, a Baptist um, pastor. So, you know, and I, I've always been a firm believer that you know your house your your house is as strong as its foundation, right? And so my foundational um, beliefs I, I'm have always been um I've been a deep deep Christian believer you know just from from how I was raised and I think over time so I, I was never really political growing up you know I, I know you know everybody in my family you know the typical black family you know you vote vote Democrat that's what you do um, so, but I, I just never really thought about it that much growing up, but, but I, I knew that I had certain, 
spiritual beliefs as a Christian, um, as a Christian growing up. And so more, you know, I just started seeing things, man. I didn't, I just started noticing things like, okay, now this, this, this isn't lining up with, with how, how you know, my, my, bi- how, how, you know, my, my biblical based belief. This is not certain. Some of these things are not lining up with, you know, the things that I believe in. And, um, I don't, I don't know if it was just necessarily a one particular thing. Like I said, I think it was just over time. I, you know, I just started seeing more and more. Okay. I don't, I don't agree with that <laughs> spiritually. I don't believe in that biblically, you know? And so it just, just a, a, a culmination of different things. And so, um, and it, it's funny now <laughs> my father, you know, I love him to this day. We're the, we're the best of friends. And he, my father's, 80, 80 years old. Um, he was a, a member of the Black Panther Party and everything. So he's he's seen things that I, I will never see in my life. Uh, he's you know going through the back door of buildings and, and and whatnot. But but to this day, you know he he says you know we're we're I'm probably more conservative than I want to admit. And I tell I say yeah, Daddy, you probably are. <laughs> you know, but 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 you know, but because you know when you just your mind is trained, you know, for a certain way for a certain time, it's kind of hard to, you know, break the way that that, that you think. So I, I said all that to say this, um, like I said, my mind was just a culmination of just li- noticing, you know, the, the, the things that the Democrats push, the things that the Democrats promote. I'm like, no, man, I, I don't believe that. And so, and so like Keisha said, I think it really, really solidified my way of thinking in um 2016 you know with the whole black lives matter thing and 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 you go you go to their website and and you look at what they're pushing you know it's supposed to be you know for for black people this but but you you go to their website and you see the things that they're pushing like wait a minute man (laughs) i don't believe this i don't believe any of that so so yeah that's 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 how mine was. It, it wasn't just one particular thing. It was just noticing over time, you know, that uh, a lot of, a lot of stuff they promote, even, and it's even worse now. It's even worse now. A lot of stuff that they're pushing now, you know, with some of this, you know, men and women's sports and all this other crap, man, it's, it's, it's horrible now. So yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, like, like, and like he used to say, you know, nothing is perfect. You know, the, uh, um, the uh, Republicans have issues too, but, but I, I judge, I look at both of them, both of these parties and say, which one lines up better with my foundation, with my spiritual foundation? And for me, it's, it's, it's a no brainer in, in terms of where I, where I am, where my beliefs are, and where I want to put my energy into trying to get uh, people elected. I think that's about it. All right. Thank you. Thank you for explaining all that, man. Um, We'll go to Barrington. What was it for you? Yes, sir. Um, I think that I need to preface what I'm about to say by saying that any type of political ideology or political belief is a learned behavior or a learned ideology. I say that because a lot of times, specifically, and I, don't, I can only speak from my experience growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, growing up in a majority black place, growing up in an all-black community for the most part, that being a Democrat... As a, from a child's perspective, is a learned ideology. So when you grow up and you see everybody around you is a Democrat, they talk bad about Republicans, they say Republicans are racist, they say all of these negative things about the GOP, and they only say positive things about the Democrats, it's going to automatically shape your entire existence, entire reality on your entire political ideology, right? So I would say that thankfully, my, I grew up with the foundation where my parents told me to to question everything and my parents told me to do not take things at face value, specifically when somebody else says it. So I want to say that I never really was a Democrat, but I only aligned myself or was pro-Democrat only because that's all I knew. Then as I got older and I started to read more so like within my mid twenties and I got exposed to Thomas Sowell, uh, Walter Williams, Shelby Steele, even going back and reading old Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, then I realized that something was wrong because the next assessment that I had to do was of my personal life. 
why is it that anytime these people, this political party speaks about black people, they speak about a black experience that I don't have. I know what it's like to grow up with my father. I don't know what it's like to grow up in poverty. I know what it's like because as far as like violence and being in dangerous neighborhoods, because that's where I grew up in Atlanta, but the things that they, or the, the shadow or the, the net, excuse me, that they casted over all blacks was always weird to me. Then finally, I would say in 2008, that's when I realized that this party wasn't right for me beyond all the other political ideologies that was out at the time. When, after the election of President Obama, and I saw how much of a farce race royalty was on a political level, that's when I knew that being a Democrat was not just a political ideology, but it was somehow appropriated to being black. And that's when I honestly totally disassociated from myself from the Democratic Party, but also this idea of, of blackness. Because essentially, at that time, I learned that from the, from the span of those eight years, I learned that we can have a black president, but it doesn't really mean anything for, for this quote unquote black struggle, black progress, because honestly, in my opinion, from my experiences again, there's no such thing as that. And so I think that ultimately, in just learning and just opening my mind up to different political beliefs and also just doing a, a self assessment of my own life and in my environment, I think that's been the biggest takeaway for me understanding that the Democratic Party was, was never for me. And, from, for, and unless it changes, in a major fashion in the future, it will never be for me. All right. Um, we'll go to Kyle. Kyle, what was it for you? I don't think that I was ever officially a, a Democrat, but I was, I was definitely succumbed to uh, wokeness. And this was actually very recent. I re and I, my story is, is very, very recent. I recently came out of wokeness in, it was during the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020. And I posted the Black Square, I posted the Black Square during 2020. I voted for Joe Biden during early elections. I didn't like Trump. I was, uh, I was fully succumbed in the, into the wokeness. And I think something that's very important is, you know, we toss that word around a lot. And I want to I want to articulate what I feel as if wokeness is. Now, I don't believe that every woke person is necessarily a leftist, but every leftist is woke. I believe that wokeism is the prerequisite towards leftist ideology. So let me explain that. Fundamentally, wokeness to me is the Wait, literally, the, the figuratively, the waiting room, the bait in order to succumb to identity politics. And this was something that emerged in the 1960s with feminism. And this was a, essentially an outgrowth from Marxism and postmodernism, this idea that we can denigrate everyone down to skin color and then take that, subvert it, and then promote that as an ideology. And I'm glad that Barrington brought that up because it was dead on about talking about ideology. And I feel as if both parties, it doesn't necessarily matter if you're a, Demo if you're a Democrat or Republican. I don't, really, I don't even necessarily like using those terms. Those terms matter. But the root issue here is ideology because there is a growing, growing, a danger ideology growing on the right just as well with anti-wokeism. And we're, see we're seeing that. It's not necessarily as prominent now but we're, we're going to see that in the future. Calling, calling for, instance, for example, calling all Democrats evil, calling every communist person evil, saying every, every person that disagrees with me is, a, is, a, is Satan. Like, it's like, for instance, like at, at, in the, the recent C, I think it was a CPAC, it was some event called something like that. And, you know, Nick Fuentes, something, some person I, I seriously detest, he said, oh, the, the government is Satan. Like we don't like the, like these sort of, these sort of sentiments are just as if not more ideological utterances coming from the right. It's that self righteousness. It's that self righteousness, moral su moral superiority that the saint that that came that literally came from people who were actually racist who used that to justify what they were doing. So when you look at it that way, 
the root issue is ideology. So I just wanted to point that out. But when I came out of Opus, this was during the BLM riots, and I remember the exact day and the exact sentence that I heard that made me, that just completely opened up my mind. Before then, this was when I was seeing Antifa and rioters. So I, I was fully, I was, let me back, sorry, I, I know I'm being all over the place, but this, this was that summer 2020. This is kind of the turning point. This is when I seen people, and you guys seen the videos, people going up to people sitting outside just enjoying themselves with those Antifa people, you know, holding their fists up, saying, save Black Lives Matter, save Black Lives Matter, and just and just harassing innocent people that do not, that don't deserve that. That to me, that would not stick right. So that was that was the first turning point. What changed my entire life essentially was when I watched when I discovered Jordan Peterson. I don't know if any anyone in here knows who that is, but that's, that's someone I, I, I highly recommend if you don't know who that is. His name is Jordan B. Peterson. He's a clinical psychologist in uh, Canada. I, I happened to stumble upon I have no idea. I can't even remember how this happened. I stumbled upon one of his videos, and this is when I was slowly starting to come out of this wokeness ideology. And I remember the exact sentence he said verbatim. This is what changed my entire outlook. He said, in fact, the very idea that there are more differences between groups than there are between individuals is the fundamental racist idea. And when he said that, my, I, I swear to God, my entire mind just exploded. Because if you think about it, the idea that there are more differences between, let's say, me and an Asian man than between me or Barrington or me or Adam, that idea, that is the root idea of, of, of what racism is. It's the idea that you, that, that you denigrate someone down to a skin color and then you use that to arbitrarily to weaponize that towards another group. You, you, you think that you, you're, you get, you, it's thinking in groups, it's group identity. That's the actual root. And when I understood that, it just completely unfolded my mind. I, I fully believed in white privilege. I fully believed in that I was oppressed. And ever since then, I, I swear to God, I, I, I didn't even know who Thomas Sowell was. I didn't even know, I didn't know anything back then. But ever since then, when I heard that sentence, that there are more differences within groups than there are between groups. Once I understood that, I just went on a complete binge. Like you guys already brought up really great names, Thomas Sowell. I mean, I looked up, I've been going even even fur, further back in, into into Jung. I've been, read, I've been reading Nietzsche. I've been reading all these great philosophers and, and psychologists who, who, who were already attacking this, so this sort of same ideology dur during the 20th century when, you know, Marxism and that whole leftist ideology really started spreading throughout Europe. It's, it's, a, it's the same exact thing. It's the same thing the Nazis did. Okay, we're better. Why? Because, because, we're, because we're German. It's, it, it's identity politics. It, it is, it's the same exact thing. It happened, it happened everywhere. And we have to understand this because we can quibble all day about, you know, Democrat or left or right, da 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 but the, the root of this problem is ideology. The root is having a rigid belief system that you fail to update to new information. Tyranny begins when man loses the desire to learn. We cannot lose the desire to learn. You cannot lose the desire to look up a new fact. How uh, Keisha said when she when she felt she felt in her soul that something isn't right. So let me go look up these facts. You're not going to look up those facts if you if if you if you if you if you if you, if you do not want to do it. You're not going to look up those facts if you're if you're holding on to a rigid belief system. You're not gonna. You're not gonna take. You're not gonna take the time to fact check. Let me. Let me borrow a term. Fact check some someone ranting an ideological rant about how they're oppressed and how white people ought to be marching in the streets with us. Her name was uh, Tamika Mallory. This was a, such an a, a, a most appalling sentence I ever heard in my life. I'm sorry if I'm getting angry. This is when this is during the BLM riots. So she said, "I don't give a damn if they burned down Target. They should have been out in the streets with us." What type of person says something like that? I'll tell you what, it's a human being who said that, an actual human being. And each and every one of us in this talk have the capacity to denigrate ourselves towards something like that. And if we don't understand that that same exact justification is, is exactly what the Nazis did in Nazi Germany, it's exactly what the Soviets did, it's exactly what every single major political movement that ended with the millions of millions of people dying, put in, put in an oven, 
sent to gulags, killed, all that happened all over the world. If we can't understand that the root idea, the root problem here is ideology, we can't understand that, then we're doomed. The solution to this is to not for is to, is to not give up on seeking knowledge. That is the root, is to believe in the logos, is to believe in the power of truth. Is to believe in the fact that you can change your current situation by acquiring new knowledge and, and updating your belief system. Once you shut down new information, that is the beginning of your demise. And we're seeing that on both sides. So I, 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 I hope, I, I implore everyone in here, please never stop seeking knowledge. Never get to a point where you, you, you don't read something because you're protecting your own bias or you're protecting your own, you, you don't want to be proven wrong. Because that is the, that is the beginning. That, that's the beginning right there. That's it. Thank you, Kyle. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll explain for myself. Um, hopefully I won't take too long because it, it's pretty much similar to what most of everybody was saying. It, it came in different waves, um, but there were pivotal points in my life where I realized that I'm done uh, with, with what's happening. So um, I guess just to first explain I am what you would call, uh, at one point in time, a default Democrat, uh, a default liberal. Um, you know, when I first got into, or tried to get into politics, as someone who knows nothing about politics, I asked someone, uh, about, you know, tell me, tell me about politics. And the first thing they said is, well, uh, Democrats are for black people and Republicans are racist. And that was the beginning of my political journey. Um, and so, you know, I'm a relatively intelligent person, but I believed information that was given to me. Uh, I believed the mainstream media was telling me the truth. Um, you know, you can only do, you can only decipher information the best you can as to what you're given. Um, and if you believe the source of your information is valid, then you feel like you're informed. Um, but I was wildly uninformed about a lot of different things, even though I was, you know, at some point in time, kind of like a, a political junkie at times. Um, I think, so there's the ideological point for myself. Um, when I started listening to podcasts, I started listening to Joe Rogan and he would have on every so often, uh, like a conservative guy who would be on there and he would ask really good questions. And I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. I never really thought about that. Um, there was a book that I read that refuted a lot of uh, bad information that was told about Donald Trump. And I was like, is this true? How come I never knew about this? And I went and looked at the video footage for myself. And I was like, holy shit, Donald Trump actually said all this stuff. And that, that book helped me realize the media is fucking lying to me about this. What else are they lying to me about? And I just started questioning every little thing, every piece of information that was given toward me or, or narrative that was told to me. I just started questioning it. And I realized the more I questioned it, the more I realized that the media is compromised and I can't trust them. I can't blindly trust them. Sometimes they give you good info. Sometimes there's an article here and there that tells you bits and pieces of information that's true, but I can't trust them. Uh, the other thing is they are heavily biased. And I realized that they were heavily biased towards my side. But I didn't want information to confirm my biases. I wanted information to tell me the truth. Um, another situation was while traveling abroad, I met a, a, a British guy. Um, and we connected and we kept in contact. And he was pro-Brexit. And I thought to myself, I thought Brexit was about like these racist white people in, in England that didn't want foreigners. And I asked him, because I had good faith in him, he's been nothing but nice to me. I asked him, why are you for Brexit? And he said almost verbatim, the United States would never allow an outside governing body to tell it what to do. 
I was like, that's a fucking really good point. What? <laughs> and so from there, I just had more conversations with him about it. And actually it took for a, a white British guy to introduce me to Thomas Sowell. And I had never heard of Thomas Sowell. And that led me down another rabbit hole of just looking up different, different people. Um, on the conservative side, uh, one thing that people don't really know about me and why like, I always tweet about uh, progressives is because when I was so open to information, I actually went further left to hear what progressives had to say. And I listened to progressive media for a period of time. And that also included listening to Jimmy Dore. And Jimmy Dore introducing all the stuff about uh, the corruption that, uh, that's happening with the Democrats and just breaking shit down and had me question certain things, question things about Obama and war. And, you know, I tweet a lot about war because I've always been anti, I've always been anti-war. One of the reasons why I got into politics is because of 9-11, you know, I was part of that, the group of people who didn't want Bush to win a second term because I was anti-war. And so I'm looking at the political party that for years I associated with and felt that I was part of had magically become uh, illiberal. You know, the party that I thought was anti-war was actually pro-war. And the information that would have helped me realize that sooner was being hidden by the media. They were shifting narratives. They were creating things out of, out of nothing. Um, they, were hiding, they were hiding information. Like for example, not a lot of people knew that Barack Obama increased wars. When I remember him specifically running for office saying no more stupid wars, right? And pointing at George W. Bush for being an idiot who was going around drone striking people and he increased it and he did more of it, right? Why, why is that the case? I thought the Democrats were the anti-war party. At least that's how I felt. So that was the progressive showed me that. And when I got done listening to the progressive ideas, I said, let me listen to the conservatives. And the conservatives made more sense to me. And what was funny is that, you know, certain things about conservatives made sense from a, like a, like a statistical standpoint, uh, more logical standpoint. And there's obviously things I don't necessarily agree with on the conservative side, just like any other side. But it, it helped me to understand that I'm a moderate human being. I find balance in, somewhere in between, somewhere in the middle, I find some sort of balance. And uh, the, I guess the final straw for me was the, I guess this last election, yeah. It was during the Democrat nomination process. Um, the level of identity politics that was used felt, felt new. Like I'd seen the, the political pandering every so often, but this was just, so, it was like a whole new level of political pandering. And now it's just wide open, right? The idea that we are specifically going to pick a black female vice president and they say it out in the open is new. 10 years ago, this would have never happened. Even if it did happen, they would have never said it, right? People, maybe even like, you know, conservatives have been like, they only picked her because she was a woman and she's black, right? And then people would say, oh, you racist conservatives. But they said it. They said it out in the open. Same thing with the Supreme Court justice. And, and it's the identity politics aspect where I started realizing they put us all in a box, especially for black people. Um, they put everyone in a box. Uh, for example, they always say white white uh, working class, uh, they say white non-educated. They don't ever say black educated, black working class, we're just black, right? There is no intellectual you know, difference between us. We all want the same thing. We all want prison reform and we all want uh, you know, reparations. Those are the only two things that we really generally care about. When last time I checked and lived in a bunch of different states and talked to a bunch of different people, we all care about how much money is going in our pocket. That is the number one thing we care about. But they never involve, even if they're talking about identity politics, they don't ever see us caring about our own economics. Only when it suits them to point out, 
oh, the poor black people, we need to give them more. And, and so the idea of identity politics just becoming at the forefront for the, for the Democrat party. And I just started realizing how I was, I guess the best way of putting it is the party that I associated with became a liberal. And so in some ways I'm kind of conservative, but I'm kind of liberal, right? And the liberal values that I believed in, I was always staunchly freedom of speech. You know, we used to point at right wingers uh, back in the nineties who wanted to put parental advisory on your CDs. Now that's the left. Even worse, they want to have you lose your job because you said something wrong. That's a liberal. I've never changed my stance. I've always been pro freedom of speech. I don't care if it's the KKK wants to walk down the street. I don't like it, but they should have the right to do so. That was always a liberal stance. And now that's the conservative stance. And the political climate has shifted. And so here I am as an independent. I'm not a Republican. I fit more on the Republican side, but I'm staunchly an independent. And I choose to be in this area because I want to be able to judge everybody equally. I want to be able to be aware and not stuck in that mold of I'm this. And that might be for some people. I just don't want to be that. Uh, I want to be able to vote for whoever I want to vote for. And right now, uh, the Democrat Party is not pro-sanity. Uh, they're illiberal. And the party is overwhelmingly corrupt. The Republican Party, especially on the federal level, plays bad guy, uh, it, the, the do-nothing party. And so I want no association with any party at the moment. Um, so that was a little bit long, but that's kind of where I come from as far as the, the whole political scheme. So, uh, you know, automatically people think I'm, I'm some Republican conservative because I'm not woke or because I talk about Democrats and their corruption. But I talk about corruption in general. I don't like Lindsey Graham, <laughs> you know. I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll call a Republican out the same way. It's just that I see more of it on one particular side and they have more power, more control. Um, so that's enough of my ranting, but um, I, guess, I guess for us, you know, Kyle brought up a good point. You know, this topic starts off talking about party, but ideology I think really matters here. Uh, it sounds like for us, ideology was kind of like the shifting point for us to rethink what party we associate with. Um, my question, anybody can answer, what was, the biggest, what was the biggest misconception that you had about the other side? Uh, probably for me, the biggest misconception I had was that Republicans were racist. So I remember the first time that I went to my local GOP REC meeting, which is the Republican Executive Committee meeting. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going in. <laughs> and, you know, everything that I had heard growing up, everything that I had ever been told was that, you know, Republicans are racist. Someone else had, had said it before, you know, it was always like, you know, Democrats are for black people, Republicans are racist. And that's just, you know, that's how it is. And so it was a little bit concerning. And it's funny because I've talked to many black folks um, who have made the switch and <laughs> we all kind of have the same story. Like um, there was one person I was talking to, he was changing his party. I think on, uh, he was looking up something online and he said he was literally like looking over his shoulder in his own home because he was about to check out something, you know, from the Republican party. He was afraid like in his own house that someone would, you know, sniff him out that he was even checking out the Republican party. And that is concerning to me. That is disturbing that we have such a loyalty. It is fascinating that we have such a loyalty to the Democrats. It, I, I really struggle to understand it. I know some people say you, you shouldn't say it's a brainwashing. You shouldn't say it's, but I really don't know what else to call it. I've never really 
seen anything quite like it where they can just say whatever. They don't have to prove anything. They can literally say whatever they want to say to you. And we just buy it as a people. Like, I, I don't know any other thing to compare it to. It's very cult-like. Um, this was so bothersome to me. I started, like, reading all these these books and, and uh, looking at all these documentaries on cults um, a couple years back. And it's very similar because you blindly – just believe whatever they say. And um, I don't know, it, it's, it is, it's very disturbing. And I don't think that, I, I just don't think that, it, I, I can see it's not a good way for us to, um, for black people, for any people to um, look at a political party where you just, they can just, say, drop a word in front of you and you just buy whatever they're saying. The moment the Democrats say racism, we ha it's like a, a switch that flips on and we feel like we have to go, you know, save the country, you know, because it's like these racist people are going to, and they know it so well. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly the thing to trigger us. It To me, them uh, Democrats doing this is a particular kind of evil because m my background is in marketing. And I, so, you know, I watch a lot of, you know, behavior and uh, pay attention to a lot of things like that. And um, behavior is something that's very much talked about in marketing and you can predict a person's behavior based on past, past behavior. And so they know, comp they know exactly what trigger words to put. They know exactly what to say. They know exactly what to do. And instead of them being servants to, you know, elected officials are supposed to be servants. And instead of them honoring that position, they use it as a, um, as a weapon to control a group of people. And, you know, I mean, I can't just put the blame on Democrats. You know, at the end of the day, the onus is on the voters. The onus is on us to say, is this what I want for my family? So I'm not even going to, um, you know, at this point in time, there's information is at the tip of your fingers. You know, there's really no excuse for anybody to be politically ignorant. I mean, yeah, it takes a lot of time to kind of research all these things and to you know, do a deep dive and to kind of to to kick the tires and figure out, you know, who's who and what's what. But you owe it to yourself and your children. You owe it to the right to vote. You owe it to this republic that is very unique from any other nation in the entire world that you have the privilege of being, if you're born here or you've uh, gotten citizenship, you owe it to yourself and your generation your to to know what's what's going on and um i actually have forgotten the question but <laughs> um i just find it really fascinating the amount of blind loyalty that many black americans have to the democrat party it's actually very disturbing uh, yeah, the the question was actually, and you answered it. The question was, what was the bis, uh, biggest misconception uh, that you had about the other side? Um, Barrington, you had put your hand your hand up. You wanted to say something? Yes, yes, absolutely. I'm, I have to um, second Keisha's sentiment. It's the the racism, the idea that the GOP is a racist party. That right there, let me know. Um, excuse me after you know, speaking with different people in the GOP and actually doing my research. And then two years ago, when our beloved president got in front of Shem God, excuse me, uh, Charlemagne the God, and said, um, if you have to decide whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. Imagine if a GOP candidate was to say that out loud on a longer public forum. 
there would not be, we would not hear the end of that. As a matter of fact, the way people talk about Trump, the way people talk about Trump today, even though he's out of office, I guarantee you this would be a soundbite for the next decade to totally demonize the Republican Party. And so I think that this, this, the, the constant usage of race, the constant um, badgering and belittling and low expectations of, of, of Black Americans as well as minorities that the Democratic Party has, to me, is some type of projection of racism that they put on to the, to the Republican Party because I feel like if anybody just takes the time and, you know, do their research, understand um, the history of the party, understand where the party has been in regards to race, they will see that that the GOP isn't the racist party or at least not the blatantly racist party. And that's all I want to say in regards to that question. All right. Um, Kyle, what was the what was the biggest misconception for you? Um, I'm, th- I'm trying to think. I, I really don't have one. Because like I said, I, I wasn't really, I wasn't very political my entire life. So I, I really had, I had, I really had no knowledge of, I didn't know what a, a Democrat or a Republican was in, in 2020. I had no idea what any of that was. All, all I, all I, all I had was was that woke ideology it was sort of bubbling I guess if you were saying my subconscious and it didn't really bring it didn't really come out until the riots and you know when George Floyd was uh, killed in that sort of moment it, it gave it gave that subconscious ideology in, in, inside of me it, that it gave rise to it it, it gave it a it gave it an application to come out and have all my lowest desires and all, and all my, my deepest, most primitive motivations of revenge and just hate came out. But thank God I snapped out of it. So I really can't answer this question because I, I really had no preconceived notions of the Republican Party. But I guess one thing, I, I one, one misconception I did have the only thing I can speak on would would be white privilege or thinking that I was oppressed. And just with the, a few moments of reading, and you know, just like you said, I'm so I'm so glad that Adam that yet you told me that you know that guy helped you out and you and you were on this quest for knowledge because that's literally what I truly believe in my soul is what brings people that that quest for knowledge. I, I believe everyone everyone in their identity is a philosopher. That word, that word in Latin is philosophia. That word literally means love of knowledge. And when you get to that point of philosophia and you are on a genuine quest for knowledge, that is the key to coming out. Like that that genuine search, that, that genuine humble inquiry, what I, I, it, it, it's so deep. I, I don't think people understand this. It's so deep. Even even to have a even to have a misconception of another party, to to even have the courage to look over there and, and and see that what is truly evil is the force that does not let you do that, is the force that tells you don't look over there. What is truly evil is the line that divides you from learning something new and the staying in your own rotten place, and that is what causes people that, that that is what causes tensions like this to arise but anyway i don't ha- i don't have a, a, mis- a misconception of the republican party per se all, all i can say is that i believe i had that rigid belief system and you know once i became semi-educated it just it just blew it all up so that's all that's all I really I can, I can say on that i'll just say thank you kyle uh kevin what about for you um <clears throat> Let's see. I think my biggest misconception, like like everybody else, that that um, that you know, Republicans were racist. <laughs> you know, Republicans hated black people. Um, you know, all the stuff that that I'm sure most of us that are black that we <laughs> we hear growing up, and and like like my like my my Twitter bio says, man, I, you know, I didn't I didn't lead the Democrat Party. The Democrat Party left me. You know, and and it. 
a, a, a lot of the, the ideologies just 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 started going way out, you know, off come way going in the left field, I guess you can say. Um I I I wanted to mention something earlier and I I forgot to mention it because some some other other people brought it up, but I also um when I started just feeling like something just wasn't right, kind of almost like in that movie The Matrix, man. You know, you just feel like something just not right. And when I started the first time I, I saw um um uh, uh, Tom Soul on, on YouTube, I was like, oh my God. This this is this man is literally saying the same thing that I'm thinking, and so the fact that he was he was bringing such he was bringing knowledge, but but from like a fact based, um, from a fact based area, not just on feelings or or how he feels or what his mama told him or anything. You know, he was he was bringing actually fact based information. So then I went from him to um, um, what's uh, Walter? Um, I forgot his name. Walter Williams. Um, Walter Williams, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Walter Williams, yeah. So I saw, I started. I actually, I, I, I would listen to him on 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 a Rush uh, Rush Limbaugh show when when he would he would come on there, and so I started digging into the, like some of his his teachings and, and some 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 stuff that he wrote as well. I'm like, oh my god, man, this this is <laughs> this is really really what you know what what I'm what I'm thinking or how how I feel about things, and so the more. So here, here in Houston, here, here in Houston, you know, we got a pretty, pretty big uh, GOP population. So when I started, you know, just going to different events, you know, and and you go in, you think, okay, man, are they going to look at me funny? <laughs> you know, as a, a black dude coming into, you know, these going to these different events, you know, but you know, you 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 realize real quickly that a lot of the stuff that you hear that you heard growing up, you know, it was just probably things that somebody passed on to them you know one of the one of the the, the biggest and, and and if if nobody has gone through this before i'm sure you probably will at some point in time if your family is is a family of mostly diehard liberals and if they find out you are conservative in any, any kind of way you know that that may make some kind of tension if if, if the conversation of politics comes up during christmas or thanksgiving Cause I, you know, I, I, I went through that, you know, and, um, like Keisha was saying, you know, it's, I can see, I can see how some people would, you know, think that it's like a, from a, almost like a cult standpoint, but then I have to step back, you know, and think. So, like I said earlier, me and my father, we're, we're, we're the, we're extremely close best of friends. And, and, and like I said, also, he was a member of the Black Panther. So, you know, my, my dad is going through stuff, man, he's seen stuff that I would never see. So when we have political discussions, you know, I just, I, I, I believe what I believe. Um, and so I don't, I don't go back and forth with him. Like, you know, I probably would somebody on Twitter, or whatever, you know, because he, he comes from an experience that people my age, you know, and younger will never, black folks, we'll never, we'll never have to go through that. So that's why a lot of times I don't understand, you know, younger people, you know, 45 and below who's never had to sit on the back of a bus, who's never had to go through the back of a building, who's never had to drink out of a certain water fountain. You know, I, I, I don't, I have a hard time comprehending when I hear you saying that you are oppressed, where you can go where you want to go, buy what you want to buy, eat what you want to eat and marry who you want to marry. I, you know, I, I have a hard time, you know, um, um, comprehending that so like i said it's the, the democrat party man it's, it's just it's just so far gone from you know what what i thought it was um growing up and so but but yeah to, to come back to come back to the original question dude I, that i think that was the biggest misconception you know hearing my uncles my dad you know growing up man yeah man they they don't like they don't like black people and and they're racist and da 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 you know and 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 like Barrington was saying, you know, if, if that's all you hear, that's all you know until until you until you grow up and you start seeing things, you start reading for yourself, you start noticing trends, especially, and this is like, like you said, man, it's, it's really blatantly obvious with the media now, it's, it's screaming, <laughs> you know, how, how obvious, um, what, what, how they try to, uh, 
play play groups against each other. But but yeah, that I think that that was my biggest misconception that that they just thought all of us, you know, just didn't like us or whatnot. Man, now now it's it's not it's not about you know the the person. You know, I think I believe most conservatives they don't care about you or you know they don't care how you look or you know it's about it's about who you are as a person at least that's from from my experience most conservatives you know truly believe you know they just how how are you as a person how are you as a you know a, a member of the community how are you as a family person how are you as a husband or a wife you know that's and, and so that that was my biggest misconception all right thank you for sharing that um for me, it's pretty much like everybody else's, uh, that all, re all Republicans are racist. And it's interesting when I go back and think about it, um, I don't really, I think I maybe talked to two people that I actually knew were Republicans or even conservative um, in my life up until, you know, kind of like my awakening. Um, so for me to have like such strong feelings or, or not even, you know, I didn't have like hatred, but like for me to have this, this concept in my head and I didn't even really know anyone, you know, to even validate my thought process. Um, and it actually kind of brings me to something else I, I, as you guys were talking, it made me think about, you know, I had started traveling a lot and going to different places and, and hearing other people's perspectives on certain things. And I remember I would come back, I would look at like certain things that, would be a certain way in uh, like, like in Germany. And then I come back to America and I look and I, and I remember getting pissed off. Like you go there, their public transportation is immaculate. You come back here, New Jersey transit is complete shit. Uh, even the subway is horrible and it's expensive. And I would be so angry and, and almost to the point of just being like anti-American feeling. Um, and I remember just like kind of having that, that this, not disgust or despise, but just kind of like not really not really valuing where I'm from, I guess that's the best way of putting it. And when I really started opening up and really looking at everything, not through like a fairy tale lenses, like I, I, I have people who live in Germany and I understand like the bad side about living in Germany and in not looking at it like it's this, this wonderful place that, you know, has great public transportation and, and people are treated this particular way. Like they got issues. Every place has issues. And when I started just to compare and contrast, like what we have here, like for example, during COVID, they got freaking police out giving you fines if you walk outside. Meanwhile, here I've gone to work every day, got in my car, drove to work throughout the entire pandemic. And so, you know, that is a completely different life you know, as much as we talk about wanting freedom, uh, even like in, in almost the strictest fashion, we never had it anywhere close to, to parts of Western Europe. And so it's, it's that kind of thing uh, that really sticks out to me and why it makes me even prouder to be an American now that I've kind of left this like box of thinking that there's always problems here and there's so many problems that there's so many problems that we have to fix everything. And it's like, I need to be appreciative of the things that I do have here. Um, and one last thing before we go to the, to the next question, um, kind of like in the frame of, you know, feeling like Republicans are racist or whatever, um, you know, I started speaking more and someone had recommended that I come and speak to this local Republican party. Most of them are older white people and they wanted to hear me speak. And I remember, uh, the woman who suggested, she is, um, you know, she's Armenian. She's from Iraq. I'm sorry, she's from Iran, uh, but she's of Armenian uh, ethnicity. And she gave me such like a, like a, a wonderful introduction and in, in how much I mean to her. And like, it almost like she almost fucking made me cry. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, before, even before that, they, they were going to get started and they sung the national anthem. And I thought to myself, would this happen at a Democrat national uh, or a Democrat uh, meeting? 
like I truly didn't know. They may do the same thing. I don't know, but they sang it with meaning. Like they really meant it. They meant every word about the uh, the national anthem. Um, this small room in Pennsylvania, and I don't know. Like I guess I became more appreciative of the country that I live in. I became more aware, but also critical, right? Because I'm not fairy tale. America is perfect. We got issues, but man, the the type of issues we have here compared to some places, nowhere close. Um, so I just wanted to to bring up like that that feeling of of being more nationalistic once I started leaving that particular mindset. Um, I actually, the, the last question I want to go to everybody and anyone can step in, but um, what did your family think when you started to, to open up about your change in views? Uh, anyone can, can jump in. Uh, I, I'll go first. I, I, have a sto- I have a story, actually. I, um, so I, back in, I guess, 2016, um, I, I would like, like a lot of stuff, you know, um, Trump related on, on, I would just like it on on Facebook. And so, um, Christmas, and this, this is kind of why I brought this up earlier. So Christmas that, that year, my, um, uncle, one one of my uncles, he came up to me at, at the, at the Christmas, um, dinner. And he said, he said, um, cause my aunt, his wife didn't come to the, to the particular, um, Christmas dinner. He said, boy, yo, yo, Annie, she sure wanted to come to this, to the dinner. I said, oh, really? I said, me? Yeah, I, I, I miss, I, I'm, I hate she's not here. He said, yeah, she, she really want to be here, boy. She had a bone to pick with you. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, she, she saw you liking all that Trump stuff on Facebook. Yeah, she had a bone to pick with you. I'm like, man, come on, man. We, we here at Christmas. We eating turkey. We getting fat. We going to be sleepy after this this ain't the time and the place for you to be having a bone to pick with me because I like some stuff, you know, some, some Trump stuff on Facebook. So, so, you know, (laughs) neatly, needless to say my, my family, they, 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 they kind of have, have a problem with it, but I will say this, the, the person that matters the most to me, as, as I've said earlier, my dad, because me and my dad are so close. And, my daddy, we we literally we have come to the point where we can respectfully disagree, because like I said, he he I know he's coming from a, he's coming from an area that I would never comprehend. I would never, you know, have to you know go through some of the stuff he went through in the in the forties and the fifties. So I I can't knock that. I can't knock that experience for him or or anybody really. Um, that's why that's why I I, I have because of that, I've kind of toned down a lot of my, my, you know, back and forth with people, you know, I listen to what they say and kind of, you know, have a cordial conversation, but in terms of, you know, rah, 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 this, and, and, uh, you're wrong or blah, I, I don't, I don't do that because, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to ever knock somebody's experience because they, they may not have the same experience that I have. Um, and, and 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 he actually told me he actually told me about a month ago. He said, "You know what? If 80, 80 year old, if Marco Rubio had won the nomination, I probably could have voted for him. I just could not vote for that damn Trump. <laughs> so at least at least you know he he was considering somebody. You know, be, being a a a, a preacher, a Christian, and all. So at least at least he was he was considering a Republican." Uh, but 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 overall, no. I we we've gotten to the point where we we don't talk about it, like you know, because it's it's such a point of contention, and 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 I'm I'm just I'm there to to have fun, and I I, I don't believe I don't believe in in because family is so important to me. I don't believe in family break you know coming apart over something like that. You know, if, if we're gonna have issues, it's gonna have to be something a whole lot more serious. You know, than than my my beliefs versus your beliefs you know we we don't have to agree on the same thing you know you, you go your way i go my way we don't have to agree on the same thing i so i but but no they they if if we were to ever sit down and like really talk yeah they 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 have a serious problem and 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 to this day that particular aunt 
that had a bone to pick, you know, <laughs> we're, 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 we're cool, but I can always tell this is it's something, you know, it's just something there. So she, she's probably holding back what she really wants to say, you know, but it, you know, it, it is what it is. And I, I, I I've, I've offered, cause I, I actually, I have some Thomas soul books and I've <laughs> offered, you know, to well, Hey, I, I let y'all read this. I don't want to read that. Blah, blah, blah. So, okay. Okay. Fine. So, okay. Okay, fine. Whatever. <laughs> so yeah, that that's that's my family story. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Barrington, what about you? Oh man, um I would say family, family have I had no issues, no static at all. Like uh, my father and I speak about different political views that we have. And to be honest, he's receptive to my thought processes because I give him things that he's never thought about before, but just like anyone who has uh, ideologies that they've been holding on to for over 40 years since they were short, since they were 20 years old, based off of their environment, they're going to hold on to it. My mom doesn't speak to me about politics. I'm her baby. She's going to love me all the same. Uh, my, I'm speaking to my 93-year-old grandmother, my, I got my 93-year-old grandmother to say that she would never vote Democrat ever again after her and I have conversations. And I'm, I'm just so thankful and blessed that she is... Um, adept and keen and mentally enough to be able to have these types of conversations with me. So my family, all in all, has been solid. They don't they don't question me. I don't question them. It's a, it's a mutual level of respect because it's a love there. However, in the last two years, I would say I lost so many friends. Um, a lot of a lot of people that were in my friend group from college mainly are gone. I just have my, my regular circle of friends. But everybody else, they're so wrapped up into the liberal ideology, thinking that everything's about race, thinking that everyone is racist, uh, putting their race first in many of their thought processes that, like, I'm talking about to the point where it's unfriended on social media. Um, like, it's, it's, really, it's really crazy. I would never th have thought that that would happen. But it's okay because in the process, I've gained friendships with people who have um, like mind, like value. So... It's a fair exchange, I feel. I hear you. Um, Keisha, what about you? Um, so <laughs> it's funny. When I first came into this new information, you know, because my family is predominantly, uh, all of us are believers, Christian believers, I thought like, I'm like, I'm going to bring this information to them. And, every, you know, they're just going to be like, yes, Keisha, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing this to me. And that did not happen. So I go to my family and I'm telling them, I'm telling them about Thomas Sowell. I'm telling them about, you know, how, you know, these views don't line up with our faith. And, you know, why would we put people in office who, are against the very thing that, you know, the very thing that we should be dividing ourselves by our faith. And uh, my mother said to me, oh my God, she's drunk the Kool-Aid. And so it was, you know, we went through like a pretty um, contentious period. And then we just decided we will not talk about politics. And so my mom, you know, she's, she's, she, she has her little jabs every now and again. I just, kind of try to let it ride but um yeah no we there is we there is a divide in my family um we do not we don't see eye to eye they are very uh you know staunchly democrat they don't really want to hear the other side <laughs> i mean i have family members that think that you know president trump was involved in like Russia collusion, no matter how much evidence is provided, no matter what, you know, no matter the investigation, it's just, it's wild to me. Um, so yeah, I've been met with a lot of, um, you know, contention for my friends. Most of my friends are like, ah, whatever. They're pretty apolitical. Um, like we sometimes we might get into like a little back and forth, but at the end of the day, they're like, yeah, whatever. Um, but yeah, my family has been pretty, it's been pretty rough. And again, I find this 
particularly evil because I know the Democrats and the media and the people who push these narratives to black people. I know they see the divide that it's causing. I know they see the destruction that they're causing to the country and they don't care. And they will continue to say these things, even, even if it's a lie. I mean, they will go, they'll say whatever, they will do whatever for power. It's really quite disgusting. Um, I'm, I, maybe it's because I am new, I'm still relatively new to politics. Um, like I said, I've been involved since like 2017, but it's still weird to me. It's still fascinating that people would go to any lengths, do anything, say anything, lead people astray, you know, just for power. You know, even just like watching the whole the science thing and the mask and the vaccine mandates and all of this stuff, just, you know, watching what people will do, watching how they'll manipulate, watching um, what, you know, just the things they'll say, the lies they'll tell for power. It's really disgusting. So, you know, you really have to be vigilant because no one's coming to save you. No one's, you know, these elect, a lot of these elected officials really do not have your best interest um, at heart. And so you really have to take the reins and do your due diligence so you can vote people out that you don't like and vote people in that you, that you want. But yeah, it's been, it's been pretty contentious for me. Yeah. Um, before I, I, give my uh, situation. Um, I want to let everybody know we do take requests. Um, so my only suggestion is if you want to speak, uh, you know, if you have a particular point you want to express, just be clear and concise, you know, to, you know, just to respect everybody's time and try to get as many people as we can so this doesn't go too long. Um, for myself, I, I got into one, uh, I would call a yelling match with a aunt of mine, uh, or she might even be my great aunt, actually. Um, all because I posted uh, statistics. The, the uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I posted statistics, and then she was like, uh, you need to call me. And it just turned into this whole big thing. Uh, she later apologized. Uh, she's a very Christian woman. She's like, you know, she prayed on it and she wants to apologize. It wasn't, it wasn't right of her. I apologize too, but uh, we haven't talked since. Uh, and funny enough, her son uh, is my pastor uh, for my, my wedding. Um, so I don't even know if he knows what happened. But um, that was the only really experience with it when it came to family. I've been, I've been very blessed because my family supports me. The family that, that I, I talk to, uh, Actually, they all support me. Um, you know, they've bought my book. They're really proud of me. Um, you know, I have my favorite cousin. He is, he's more liberal minded. And he's like, ah, you know, I don't really agree, but that's okay. Like, <laughs> I'm like, perfect. <laughs> so, um, but he still supports me. He's really proud of me. And that's all I care about, you know. Um, for myself, I'm, I don't really need a ton of affirmation, you know. Me writing my book was for me to express myself. And if people gain something from it, I'm happy they're able to. But, um, you know, it was for me to finally express myself. You know, nobody really knew my political stance. And I wanted to, to have my voice out there in the public because I felt like there weren't enough people um, who had a counterpoint to the, to the narrative. So um, that's why I'm really big on, on expression. So uh, I've, I did have uh, a couple of friends who stopped talking to me. Um, one, of them, one of them put on Facebook that Donald Trump said that Americans should drink bleach. And I'm like, let me go see this for myself. And I watched it. I was like, he didn't say that. You know that, right? And he was like, yeah, well, he should have been more careful. And then after that, he never talked to me again. Uh, <laughs> you know, so... Um, the, the people, like someone else said, the people that I lost, which is very little, I've gained so many more, 
uh, genuine friends, uh, even the people on the panel here who have been extremely supportive, um, uh, you know, along the process and, and respect my individu individuality. And, you know, and, you know, we may agree on most things and disagree on a, a few things, but that doesn't really matter. Like, I just care about good moral people. Um, I don't care if they're Democrats or Republicans. As long as they're good people, that's that's all I care about. Uh, and as long as we respect each other and have good faith conversations, then that's fine. If we, and and another thing, you don't have to talk politics with everyone. Uh, I think that's become like the norm. But that this is actually abnormal. Uh, you know, you don't have to tell everybody your politics. So if you want to keep a friendship, don't talk about politics. You know, find the things that you have in common and, and grow from there. Um, so we'll go to the people who actually want to uh, have their piece. Uh, Rosie. Rosie wants to speak. Rosie, you can unmute yourself. Are you there, Rosie? Blink twice, if you can hear me. Rosie's been waiting for a while, so maybe she fell asleep. I will remove her as speaker. While Rosie's coming on, or while you're picking your next speaker, I will say it's hard to not talk about politics, especially if you work in politics, because the first thing that people ask you is, what do you do? And I remember I was, I used to be like, it's controversial. I really don't want to talk about it. And of course that would make people even more intrigued, but um, it's hard to not talk about politics when you work in politics. Now, if you don't work in it, it's probably a little bit more easier to do, but when you're like, you know, it's your job and things like that, it's hard to not talk about it. I don't know. I was just, just my two cents on that. <laughs> No, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, we'll go to Gabs. Gabs, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, there was a delay in in the uh, in the sound, so maybe that's what Rosie experienced. Um. Well, I. I was never a Democrat, but I didn't vote for anybody for like 10 years because I couldn't I couldn't see voting for anybody. I, I thought everybody was horrible. Uh, and then I, I was sitting watching Trump's speech, his, you know, what the hell do you have to lose thing? And I was just like, yeah, what the hell do I have to lose? <laughs> and um and so I didn't say anything to anybody. I just voted for him. And then about, I don't know, two or three weeks into his presidency, he did, he, he, there was some event that happened and it benefited me and my family. And I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like some kind of a, program, I think it was a tra job training program that he implemented. Um, and it was, it was being implemented in, in my area. And my son, one of my sons was taking part in it, was going to be able to take part in it. And I was so excited. And I put on Facebook, I love my president. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was like, I, I had, I, I've got about 300 plus relatives and every single one of them descended upon me on Facebook. It was just like, just a barrage of how can you do that? What do you, what do you mean? You know, leave it up to you to say some, you know, bullshit like that. I mean, it was just, it was just, just one right after another of constant just beratement from all of my family members. And, and I mean, and it was like daily, you know, from then on until I just, I just started blocking people left and right. 
because I wasn't finna sit through that nonsense every day. And, you know, even when I explained what, you know, what it meant for us and what it meant for my family, you know, what, what that was going to do for us, because my sons couldn't find jobs for years. They were going out looking for jobs. They were doing job training programs, all of that stuff, and still couldn't get jobs. They were getting, you know, they were getting fast food jobs that were only giving them 10 hours a week and stuff like that. Like we were, we were really struggling. And when we found, we were finally able to, you know, get somewhere with some of these things. And then the, then the, uh, you know, the, um, you know, some other programs that he started implementing were, you know, they were benefiting our area. The, the, um, the, uh, the program where, you know, the, to build up the uh, businesses in the, in the uh, urban areas, those kinds of things, those things were helping us. You know, one, another one of my sons, he got a job in the, in, in a, a new, a new uh, restaurant that had opened up uh, in an opportunity zone well, that wasn't, that wouldn't have happened, you know? And we, you know, I lost all kinds of friends and all kinds of relatives stopped speaking to me. And I stopped speaking to several of them because seriously, it was a, a constant barrage of them uh, just constantly harassing me all the time. And I got sick of it. But me and my family, we, we went from we went from doing OK to literally losing everything over the course of the five years uh, before Trump. And we, we, what were we supposed to do? And how were we supposed to make it? And we did everything we could. We were taking every job we could. Gas was getting too expensive for us to be able to afford it. Food was getting too expensive for us to be able to afford it. We were, we were doing everything we knew to do. And we, we couldn't, we couldn't get, we couldn't get by. We were doing odd jobs. We were, I mean, we were doing everything. Everything short of moving to another to another place. And even that was something that wasn't in, in, in the cards for us. That wasn't something that we could easily just get up and do. So, you know, and I mean, so another thing that that wasn't ever really talked about was, is that, you know, people who were on who, who were on uh, Medicaid and stuff like that, like me at the time, I was in a wheelchair. And people who were on Medicaid were being denied surgeries, minor surgeries, for years. Well, he said, no, give them those surgeries and let them get back to work. Well, I was one of the first people to get that surgery. That was one of the things that they didn't talk about. We had, I had been denied for surgery for years. And I got that surgery and I got up and I got up and got to work. That was part another part of uh, what he was doing to get people off of opioids. That was never really talked about. And we, you know, when that happened, I mean, all of these things that happened under Trump made, made it so we were able to get out of poverty. And that was something that we weren't able to do before. We weren't in poverty before Obama and we were able to get, we, we got in poverty during Obama and we were able to get out of poverty because of Trump. But my family didn't care about that. And the people around us didn't care anything about that. And our friends didn't care anything about that. All they cared about was he was racist. Even when I would show them all of the stuff that happened, helped us, all of the things that helped us, and all of the videos of him denouncing the, the you know, people in Charlottesville and all that, they didn't care about any of that. All they knew was CNN said this. They didn't care about any of that stuff. So afterwards, I just said, you know what? You have to you have to think for yourself and you can't be worried about what anybody else says. Because at the end of the day, we we were in trouble and we had to do what we had to do in order to survive. Wow. Um thank you guys. Once again, um Anybody want to say anything as to what she was what she was talking about? Um, I do. I like I, I really struggle to understand how. And first of all, let me just say, uh, Gab, I'm I'm I, I'm so grateful that you were able to come up out of that, and I'm so sorry that you had to go through that in the first place. 
Um, but as far as, you know, the, the, you know, black Americans just being like, you know, her family or people close to her not caring about what she went through. And many times these are the same people that will be like, oh, I love black people. Oh, black people, you know, we got to fight for black people. Well, you're like, well, I'm black and I'm struggling with this, but I'm, I'm doing something else. They will totally dismiss you because you are a Republican. It is very strange. I don't understand how people can be so... You know, I, I posted something on Instagram the other day. There was this guy, he was just saying, basically, it wasn't a political speech. He was like, you cannot hold on to the past. You know, whenever you're holding on to the past, whenever you're holding on to the past, you're not moving forward. You are, you know, you, you've got to do whatever you can do to make a better life for yourself. You know, just just an uplifting sort of speech or whatever. And I'm listening to this and all he's saying is just kind of universal law, just, just basic universal principles. If you do X, you'll get Y. If you, you know, if you don't do these things, you'll get the consequences of those things. And all these black folks are like, yes, you know, they're siding with him. Let him have been a Republican and said the very same thing. It's like those universal laws no longer apply. Those universal principles no longer apply simply because you're coming, because you have said that I'm a conservative or I'm a, a Republican. I don't understand how we can just do away. We just disregard life principles. You know, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, the Bible talks about so many instances of you know, I, I talk sometimes about the, the, the men with the talents. God gave one guy 10, one guy five, and one guy one. The, the men that he gave the 10 and the five who doubled, he blessed them. So, and the one that he gave the one to who hid his talent and didn't do anything with it, he rebuked him and took away what he had. And so, you know, the, these, these parables and these stories show that God wants you to produce. And I bring that up to say, these are just solid life principles that if applied, benefit everybody. It's not a color thing. It doesn't matter what you look like. If you do this, you will get that. But the moment you put an R beside your name or you say, you know what? I voted for this guy. Or yeah, I'm a conservative, or I'm a Republican, whatever. All of a sudden, those principles don't apply to you anymore. It, 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 I just do not understand it. And I really would like to understand that. That if, if, I can, if I can have anything, I want to understand how me being black and Republican or black and conservative, all of a sudden makes life, makes universal law not apply. Sorry, just a little bit of a rant. <laughs> no, thank you. Oh, you know, well, you're going to say something. Uh, yeah, um, I was, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, 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 in what Keisha just said. I mean, it, it was so on point, but so I, I think a lot of this, and, and I know this may be a sim very simplistic explanation, but I blame so much, man, so much of what's going on in, in our community, in our world, or what I blame so much of it on, on, on media, social media, network media to you know from a standpoint of you know this this is what this is what's being people see all day every day they they see it on their tvs they see it on their phones that they have with them all day every day and people are being inundated with you know uh uh, uh, uh to to the point where simple principles that, that Keith was just talking about you know if this then that is it's been overwritten with well if this, then that doesn't mean anything because of your skin color. X, X and Y, two plus two is not four because of your skin color, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I, 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 I truly believe cause gr growing up, you know, growing up in the, in the, in the, in the eighties and the nineties, you know, I, I was never, like I said, I wasn't really big into politics. So I don't, I don't know if it was this bad, 
I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to, you know, graduate from high school and college. <clears throat> so I don't know if it was this bad, but but I think because social media is just so so prominent in people's lives now, now you have people, kids, teenagers being inundated with, you know, this, you can't do this because of white supremacy this or white privilege that. And 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 and, you, and they see this mess all day, every day. Then you see it on the, in the on the news. So then it gets to almost to the point where it's 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 like a, why well, man, it's like a a mass hypnosis almost kind of thing. Where you know to the point where sim- something something as simplistic as a Bible principle of you know use your talents and you will produce. You know and and uh, it's being like I said, it's being overwritten with well, you know. Uh, you can't do this, or, or or white folks this, and blah blah blah. I'm like, wow, man, this is it's, it's really crazy. It's really crazy to me. And like I said, I I I really just in my opinion, I, I believe all of this, all of this mess we're going through, all of this stuff that that we're we see, and and these these attitudes from family members, from fam- people who supposed to love you, right? People you grew up with, they also are being inundated with media, network. And social, you know, so to the point where you're like, wait a minute, Uncle so, such and such, you know, we, we supposed to be cool, <laughs> you know, how you mad at me just because I, I like something on Facebook, you know, and and I, I pray, I pray so hard that that it, it, it gets better, but I just, I have a feeling it's just going to continue to get, as, as long as social media is a thing, as long as CNN is, you know, uh, uh, um, I mean, of, of course, you know, there, there's, there's bias in the, in the in the media but but if if you if if a place is trying to come across as a you know an objective network you know as, as long as it's that it's it's, it's probably it's probably just going to get worse so it's it's going to be up to us to continue to try to push you know conservative principles and 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 love of love of god you know love of you know your your faith love of the country to to try to push back against all of these men because it's it's a it's an ongoing battle is when, when you have to when you have to battle with your family that's when you know it's it's a serious ongoing battle, serious ongoing battle for uh um, culturally um um yeah okay that's 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 what i have thank you kevin um yeah keisha you were saying before you know once someone says something and they have an R next to their name, it's no longer valid. Um, I wrote a chapter in my book that basically talks about how, um, you know, people lose their jobs all the time in the public for saying racist comments, right? Or, or not even racist, but offensive comments, right? Um, no one that I've ever heard of has ever lost their job because they called someone an Uncle Tom or a coon, flat out in public. Uh, I think it was Joanne Reed. Uh, uh, hopefully I'm not messing up. But I think it was Joanne Reed who called Clarence Thomas Uncle Thomas, right? Um, or Uncle Clarence, I think she called him, right? Making reference to Uncle Tom. Um, so it's, it's that kind of thing where it's allowed. Our society allows the smearing of, of conserv- black conservatives and black Republicans um, just because. Right. It doesn't matter what their message says. And I, and I would venture to say that I think a lot of people who don't like, like someone like a Clarence Thomas, they don't even know why. You know, and uh, the reason I say that is because I was kind of one of those people who kind of just like didn't hate, but just, you know, dismissed certain people. Um, and I'll say real quick and I'll, I'll take one. We have one more request to speak. Um, ben Carson. I kind of dismissed Ben Carson. And, you know, when my eyes were awakened and I was just curious and wanted to learn, um, I watched a Ben Carson interview and heard him, heard him talk. And all the things that he went through as a kid, um, growing up in a similar kind of household situation as me, um, his struggles in school overcame those things and, and came to such great, you know, great, great accomplishments. And I'm like, man, I dismiss this guy. He's a great American. Like the man, he's been married forever, has a healthy family. Like this is like fucking uh, Mr. Huxtable right here. Like that, and and I just dismissed this guy, and I felt really guilty. Like I've never met the guy, but I felt guilty for feeling that way about him. And why? Well, 
because he was a Republican, right? And and that was one of those experiences where I said, I'm not going to just dismiss people because of, uh, you know, their political affiliation or their, their viewpoint, you know, especially someone in the public eye. If I don't like someone, I have a clear reason why I don't like them, right? I don't like Nancy Pelosi, and I got clear reasons why. Um, so... You know, if someone asked me, I can give them the answer. But if you were to ask me before, why didn't I like Ben Carson? I couldn't give you a clear answer. But there was nobody around me to even challenge me on those things, right? So why does it happen? Because people lack curiosity and people are safe in their corner. You know, I think that's that's the simplest answer to kind of give to your to your question, Keisha. Um, we'll go to know your PPC. Yeah, you know me. Uh, did they disappear? I think they disappeared. Can you guys still hear me? I just want to make sure it's not just me. Yes, we can. We can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I guess they they spoke for like a split second and then they disappeared. So uh, we'll go to one last person and then we'll wrap up. We'll go to Sahara. The most grateful person I've ever met, Sahara. Hey guys, good evening. Hello, uh, this is Sahara. Thanks uh, Adam for hosting spaces like this uh, amazing conversation. And a lot of things resonated with me. I am, you know, I migrated this country. Adam, you know my story a little bit. Um, but, you know, the, the interesting thing, I was put in a box when I came to this country. I was told the Democrats, which I didn't even know the English, right? I was just learning the country. I came here and I was told this is your side. And I'm like, I don't want to be put in a box because I, you know, I ran away from a box and socialist country i'm from africa east africa so um when i came here sadly a lot of a lot of immigrants are you know associated with the democrats because you are told the other side is racist bigot they hate immigrants and all about that and and then i said well thanks for letting me know and i'm going to do my research so i did my own research and then i was uh <laughs> I, I was basically ended up in the uh, rabbit hole so I found out Thomas Sowell, Shelby Steele, and these are black people, you know, the other side. And, I, and then I came back with my research and then I was told I was radical Republican. So, you know, the, the sad part is people are not willing to have a conversation. And uh, why do I have to put it in? I mean, why do I have to put it in a box? And, and it's sad. People use your skin color. So I refuse because I don't like labels. I never liked labels and names and political identity and at the end of the day for me i'm just a human being i'm sahara the free and i'm a human being i don't like labels and i don't look at my skin color you know so i think that what i have seen uh is i think the fear a lot of people are scared to come out from the other side the democrats party is because people get backlashes you get dehumanized i have seen it and uh and i think it we need to have a conversation. We need to talk and we need to stop putting in a box and labels each other. Uh, but I have, I have, I have, I have put it in a box, you guys, just without even not knowing, you know, the country and the politics or anything. I wasn't even speaking the language and there's a, and, and you wonder why a lot of, a lot of um, immigrants are Democrats because in the beginning, when you come, you are told this is your line. And I never uh, accepted that line because I don't like to be any um, any line. I'm just a free person. I'm not any party right now. I'm just a free thinker, American citizen. I love this country. And then the other thing really, really uh, made me question this party or, or the Democrats party is, which I was never part of it, was when, um, when Trump said, make America great. And I said, oh, good, good for him. I said, somebody at least say make America great because if America is great, in my opinion, the whole world is great, is safe because America has to be secure and safe. And I love this country. So, 
So I was told this country is racist. And then when I said it's not racist, I'm not, you know, I don't fear um, white people or white people are not chasing me. Uh, I do have a story because we all do have a story, regardless where you come from. And when I said I have a story and, you know, the community I'm from, there are things that are taboos to talk about it. I was told we're not going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about white. You know, if you are being oppressed by white, then I said I'm not oppressed by white. I'm being oppressed some some of my families and my people. So they don't want to talk about topics that really matter. And and that's what really made me question. And it's like, I'm not going to fit a, I'm not going to fit it in a box and I'm going to question and I'm going to speak for myself. And I'm going to tell the, if somebody like, for example, the immigrants, you don't have to be a Democrat. You don't have to stay in this box, but there is a fear because there are a lot of immigrants who are also feeling, you know, the same way, but they are afraid to question. I think we need to have more, more conversation and we need to stop dehumanizing. And, um, but I just want to say that. So uh, this topic was so relatable. So thank you guys for having this conversation. Thank you, Sahar. I appreciate you. Um, we're going to start to wrap up. I want to respect everybody's time. Um, we'll go to final words. Uh, Barrington. Do you have any final words? Yes, sir. Um, great conversation, everybody. I love having uh, conversations like this because it gives me insight and it helps me understand or better shape my perspective on not just myself, but just everyone in this country because, you know, I just feel like, you know, we are not a people as a race. We are a people as a nation, and we should start to really see ourselves that way. We're one people, one nation um, with a different mindsets, different ideas on how to move forward, but yet we want the same wants and we have the same needs as far as basic necessities. Now, in regards to political parties, I wanted to say this earlier, but it had nothing to do with the conversation. I think that we should stop just limiting ourselves based on party um, beliefs or party attachments, but just, you know, look at the things that we want and the, the commonalities that we share amongst one another. And I think that we continuously uh, move forward in that direction we could build the future and we could build the nation that we've always dreamed of. All right. Thank you, Barrington. Kevin. I, I want to ditto everything Barrington just said. He, he summed it up perfectly. Um, we, 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 we have a, I think we have a, a lot of work to do um, as, as a group. And I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I, I got some, some insight into you know, some of the people who I see all the time on, on Twitter, you know, and just, just to hear, you know, hear them directly is kind of, you know, it was really, really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I, I really believe that, you know, we can, if we continue to, you know, just stress conservative values, man, and, 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 and um, love, love for each other and love for the country, love for God, you know, I think we will, we'll be good. But no, I, I really I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you coming on here too, um, Keisha. Yeah, um, I really enjoy this conversation. I always enjoy um, talking about these these things because a lot of times, you know, as we continue to talk, I still you know am able to challenge my own thoughts and you know just just kind of kick the tires of, you know, things that I have, you know, believed because, you know, you, you do change over the years, you know, your, your thoughts on some things evolve or sometimes, you know, they, they can kind of, um, you know, you just evolve or change or stay the same, but just listening, having these conversations, you can challenge yourselves. And if I can say anything to the audience, um, just don't be afraid to challenge your own thinking. Don't be afraid to um, question yourself. Don't, I mean, what What do you have, I <laughs> sound like Donald Trump, what do you have to lose? You know, you, you should want, we should all be striving to make sure that we are giving ourselves the best perspective possible, ourselves and our children, because I mean, who wants to go through life 
you know, with bad ideas, with wrongheaded thinking, and, and you, you stay stuck in those bad ideas and wrongheaded thinking when you don't challenge your own thoughts, when you don't question. If I could just leave you guys with a really, really quick story. Okay, so there was this woman who was baked every Thanksgiving, she would take the legs off of uh, her uh, off of the turkey. And, you know, she was doing it year after year. And she was like, oh, my mother used to do it this way. And so people started asking her, like, well, why do you take the legs off of the turkey? And she's like, oh, well, this is how, this is just what we do. This is how you cook a turkey. This is what my mother did. It's tradition. And so finally she went and asked her mom, mom, why do you take the legs off of the turkey when, you, you know, when you cook it? And her mom's like, oh, my God, you still do that? She was like, honey. I just did that because my oven was so small. You don't have to take the legs off of the turkey. And I bring that up to say, we do things sometimes. We adopt thinking, ways of thinking. We adopt things that we do without checking why it is being done. And I know that is so, so much the story for many Black Americans voting for Democrats, um, just believing that America is racist, not really knowing the history, you know, not understanding why America even exists, and just so many things, because that's just been the story. And it's just been passed down and passed down. And we don't question what we've been told. So I know for me, I don't want to just go through life doing something because that's just what everybody has done. And not questioning anything because anything because I don't want to turn around and have taught my children something that excuse me that doesn't benefit them and certainly you know and and not myself either so um, you know I just encourage everybody to question yourself you know challenge your thinking and do a little do do some digging and make sure that you know you're solid in what you believe and that you can back up what you say thank you. Hey. One, one, one more thing, brother. I, I want to kind of um, piggyback on what she just, on what Keisha just said. You know, in terms of challenging yourself, you know, yeah, I think it's it's even good that you know when you're amongst people that you have shared beliefs. I mean, I think it's even good um, to have discussions in, in, because not everybody believes the same thing on the same side. You know, uh, um, one one of the brothers that's that's in the in the in the, the group here, um, uh, Mr. Malik Abdul, you know, one uh, intelligent brother who I follow here on, on Twitter, you know, he's kind of challenged me a couple of times. I'm like, okay, let me, let me think about that. Let me think about it in a different way. So I, I think it's also, also good, you know, to, you know, it, like, like he said, challenge, you know, try to grow, grow, growing your knowledge and, 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 and challenge yourself um, to, to just, just to grow, grow your thinking, grow your, the way, the way that you're thinking, and 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 um, yeah, ne- try you you want to want to um, maybe get him on on one of one of the next one you have, because he he had, brother has some good takes. Thank you. Well, and uh, yeah, yeah, Malik is a uh, is a good dude uh, from our conversations thus far. Um, so my final words, I guess I got a bunch of final words. Um, I guess the one thing I learned is that Thomas Sowell is the gateway drug to independent thought uh, for Black people. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, it's, it's like I remember the first time I had Thomas Sowell. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, it's. But Thomas Sowell is an influential figure. Um, not necessarily that you 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 consume him and automatically you know you turn a particular way, but it, I think it's like anything else, you know, the reason why Thomas Sowell is so influential is because it's new information that a lot of people spend their entire adulthood never hearing. Um, you know, I actually have a, um, a sketch drawing of Thomas Sowell on my wall, right? He was very influential for me for writing my book. Um, you know, so it, it's, it sounds cliche, but um, you know, he's a very important figure uh, for for thought and conservative thought, or even kind of libertarian kind of thought. Um, and it's it's highly appreciated. If anybody, if no one's ever read his book or or anything like that, I highly recommend it. Um, 
what do you think uh, what do you think some of these liberals would say if some of these schools started putting Thomas Sowell books in in schools and Dr. Walt E. Williams, Shelby Steele books in, in these schools. What what do you think they're they're Oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. They'll they'll automatically dismiss it because anytime you bring up soul to a liberal or like a far leftist thinker, they mm-hmm. say they say they say this the normal insults that they always say, Oh, well, he he has a Eurocentric way of thinking. Well, um he he, he panders to white supremacists, he panders mm-hmm. To, okay. to whites, like all that other BS, which which they, they haven't even read a like a page or a paragraph to even know these things. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I guess my my other the other thing I was going to say is I, I want I want everybody to understand. I don't I don't know everybody's political affiliation or ideological thought who's who's listened to this, but I want people to understand. You know for just by coincidence our entire panel is black right for us to make a change an ideological change a political shift to a different party or to leave a particular party and make it public it is not easy right um and i I think there is this idea that um someone like myself would announce this publicly and you know because i found a new grift and no, like there's there's a there's a lot to there's a lot to unpack for someone to make that that decision to to even say how they truly feel or to announce like maybe I was wrong, right? You know, for you to make a change in your life, an ideological change, that means that you have to come to the conclusion that you were wrong, right? And you don't believe in this anymore. That is a huge mental shift, right? And and it, not a lot of people are even willing to even take that risk. You know, so a lot of people are conformists. They're, they're so willing to conform to whatever they're raised with, uh, whatever their surroundings are. And, you know, even for myself, and in some ways I conform politically. I didn't challenge what was, taught, what was told to me. I didn't challenge it enough. And I can make excuses, but that's, that's, my, that's my accountability right there. I didn't challenge enough was told to me. And I think people need to understand making that mental shift is not something that's easy. It's not something that's taken lightly. You know, we could have, we could have lost precious family members. You know, I don't know what my mom would have reacted and said, you know, that's a risk that I took. I don't know if my sister would have never talked to me again. That's a risk. It's a huge risk. And some people take politics way too seriously, but you, you have no control over that. And you know, I thank God that that wasn't the situation with my family, but you have to understand that th- this is a risk to make, uh, th- you know, this decision to come out publicly and say these particular things. Um, you know, I heard someone who, uh, a, it was a black conservative who said, I think it was Rob Smith, who said he got more shit for coming out conservative than coming out gay, right? <laughs> you know, that's how strong it is, uh, you know, for, for someone to make that ideological shift in a public manner. So I, I think, I, I, yeah, were you going to say? Sorry. No, I was going to say, I, I commend, I commend any black conservative man who, who's, who's in the public, who's, who's in the public, you know, on TV, because like, like, like Keisha said, if you, you know, if we, we, when you, when you work in politics and you're on TV, you have a, you have a different kind of pressure. You have a different kind of pressure, you know, from, family members or whatever as you know as opposed to somebody who just comments you know on social media uh, so I, I mean I, I i have all the utmost respect for her and and rob and you know other other people who who are you know uh, black conservatives but but are out on tv you know in, in the public eye you know that that's i have the utmost respect for for folks who who can who can do that yeah man same here same here, you know, and, and like I said, one last thing I'll say is, you know, for me to go from being basically just an average American who just said nothing, kept to himself, to write a book and share my thoughts, my, you know, my, my childhood and everything, um, and, and not know how people would react to it, that is some scary shit, you know, and that's what it's like, you know, it is scary to reveal yourself and not know how people are going to react. 
not know if your job is going to fire you, not know if your family members are going to disown you, not know if your friends are ever going to talk to you again. That's some scary shit to go through. And so it takes a level of, of braveness for someone to actually do that, to make that leap, to say, damn what everybody else thinks. This is how I feel. I'm going to express myself. It's all right for everybody else to put on a Black Lives Matter shirt and raise their fists and say Trump is terrible. Well, why can't I participate in this? Why can't I have my voice heard? So that's why I'm adamant about free speech. I still have that liberal principle of freedom of speech and people speaking openly about how they feel, damn what everybody else says and, and do, what you, do what you feel is right. Um, so I just wanted to convey that message being black and being not even uh, conservative, just being a moderate, you know, is a risk. And, and it's a risk that people don't fully understand um, because there is no consequence to destroying a black conservative's life. There is no consequence to calling a black conservative a nigger. There is no consequence to calling them a coon, an Uncle Tom, to slander them, to say that everything that they're saying out of their mouth is coming from a white person. There is no consequence. No, no, no MSNBC anchor is going to lose their job, right? No one in CNN, no one, no one in the public eye will ever lose a job for outright slandering another black person, especially if it's another black person. So I just wanted to convey that message that the people that you have in this panel are some of the bravest people you'll ever hear speak. So with that, with that said, um, Thank you, everybody. Uh, I meant to mention Kyle had to leave early, um, but I want to thank him for coming on. I really appreciate it. I think Barrington just dropped out. Uh, he has to go um, see what, what's going on down in Montego Bay. Um, <laughs> I love how everybody thinks he's Jamaican. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but I want to thank Kevin, Keisha. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome, man. All right. And everybody else, uh, this is a Good Faith Space. If you want to listen to previous episodes, go to a goodfaithspace.com. It'll bring you to the YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. Listen to the other conversations we had. They're not all political. Um, one of my favorite ones is about mental health in the military. It's very eye-opening. Um, you know, please listen to it. Um, follow me on, on Twitter. Follow everybody who's on the panel on Twitter. Um, everybody have a wonderful night. Um, if you're into reading books, get Black Victor to Black Victor, uh, shameless plug. And um, have a wonderful night. Stay safe out there. And uh, God bless America.